Hey everyone, just a few things before we get started. Um, your chapter one quiz is due Wednesday the 27th by 11.59 p.m. Um, your chapter two and three quizzes, however, are going to be due on Friday instead of Wednesday, so they are due Friday the 29th at 11.59 p.m. I wanted to give you some more time so that you can listen to the lectures and take time to review the chapters before you do your quizzes. I will post a lecture for chapter three on Wednesday, probably um, more like evening time. And um, electrolyte imbalances and acid-base imbalances are really complex topics. Don't get discouraged by this chapter. It is important info, but you'll see it in your nursing classes in the future. So I just want you to get a basic foundation of it here. Um, it can be complex. It can be difficult to understand. Um, if you do have any questions, please reach out to me. I would love to help you. All right, we're going to pick up where we left off on slide 35. All right, um, potassium, the chemical symbol for potassium is K. It's a major intracellular cation. Serum levels are low and they have a narrow range. And make sure you're becoming familiar with the normal serum lab values that are in the front cover of your book. And understand that the normal range can vary slightly depending on the facility. So for example, for potassium, the inside front cover of your book says that normal is 3.8 to 5 milliequivalents per liter, but the hospital considers normal to be 3.5 to 5. Neither range is wrong necessarily, and for testing purposes, I would not have any lab value that would be closely out of range. I'm not trying to trick you. Um, potassium is ingested in food, and it's primarily excreted in the urine with the help of aldosterone. Uh, some foods high in potassium are bananas, citrus fruits, tomatoes, lentils. Uh, dietary information like this is important in nursing. We educate our patients on special diets all the time, so it's important to know which foods are high in which nutrients and electrolytes. 
Insulin, both the hormone produced in your body and the artificial kind that's injectable, promotes movement of potassium into the cells. And we'll talk about this more when we discuss diabetes. Potassium levels are influenced by the acid-base balance in the body. We'll discuss this later in this chapter, but just note that acidosis shifts potassium out of the cell and alkalosis shifts potassium into the cell. Uh, when there's an excess of potassium ions in the, interstitial, in the interstitial fluid, they diffuse into the blood, causing hyperkalemia. Remember, hyper means elevated, and think of the K in hyperkalemia um, and the K that's the chemical symbol for potassium. Hyperkalemia is elevated potassium. potassium. Um, very important note, abnormal potassium levels, both high and low, have a significant and serious effect on the contractions of the heart muscle. This can cause cardiac arrest. This table is on page 26 in your book. That's one of the ones that is important to study. It tells you the signs and symptoms of a potassium imbalance, which would be hypokalemia or hyperkalemia. And this is on page 22 in your book. I briefly mentioned the sodium potassium relationship in class, and this is a diagram of how that works. So we have polarization where potassium is inside of the cell and sodium is outside of the cell, and this is a resting state. In depolarization, stimulation opens the sodium channels and sodium moves into the cell. And then in repolarization, an impulse moves along the membrane and sodium channels close while potassium channels open, and this moves potassium out of the cell. And then the channels close and the cell returns to a normal resting state. Some causes of hypokalemia are um, losses like diarrhea, diuresis with some diuretic drugs like Lasix. Um, it's a loop diuretic. If you have a patient on Lasix or another diuretic that does not retain potassium in the body, it's important to know which foods you can recommend for your patients to help prevent hypokalemia. If there's an excessive aldosterone or glucocorticoid in the body, like in Cushing syndrome, where sodium is retained, potassium is ex excreted. Um, decreased dietary intake, and I don't mean not eating for a day or two um, or not eating much, but think more like alcoholism, eating disorders, starvation, and treatment of DKA with insulin. So earlier I mentioned that insulin lowers potassium. Sometimes the body produces too much insulin and this can lower potassium. And sometimes we have to give large amounts of insulin to treat DKA and that can cause hypokalemia too. So what happens if someone has hypokalemia? We're gonna see cardiac dysrhythmias. That's one of the most severe things that can happen in, in an imbalance in potassium. Hypokalemia also interferes with the neuromuscular function, so the muscles become less responsive. So what we see from this is fatigue and muscle weakness, particularly in the legs. So later we're gonna discuss electrolyte imbalances that cause muscle cramping. Make sure that when you're studying, you differentiate those that cause muscle weakness, those that cause muscle cramping, muscle spasms. Um, make sure you're able to differentiate between those, not just the fact that a certain electrolyte imbalance um, affects the muscles in general. And then we have paresthesis, and that's when you feel like the pins and needles um, a decreased digestive tract motility or movement. Uh, potassium affects the muscles, so if there's severe hypokalemia, respiratory muscles become weak, and that can lead to shallow respirations. And also in severe hypokalemia, we see impairment of renal function. This increases the urine output, which means which is polyuria, and it uh, creates very diluted urine. Now we're going to talk about hyperkalemia, which is elevated potassium. Hyperkalemia is a serum or blood level of potassium greater than 5 milliequivalents per liter. This causes, or the causes of hyperkalemia are renal failure, and that's when the body retains potassium if the kidneys aren't properly working. 
um, a deficit of aldosterone, which causes the body to retain potassium, uh, potassium sparing diuretics, which are medications that promote urination but prevent excessive excretion of potassium in the urine, and that's like spironolactone. Um, and leakage of intracellular potassium into extracellular fluids, like in patients with burns, and displacement of potassium from cells by prolonged or severe acidosis. This image is on page 25 in your book. It demonstrates the relationship of hydrogen and potassium ions. And the effects of hyperkalemia are cardiac dysrhythmias. And you can refer to the EKG images on page 26 in your book. For this class, you don't need to know the specific EKG changes. Just know that potassium imbalances cause dysrhythmias that can lead to cardiac arrest. Um, hyperkalemia also causes muscle weakness. And remember, weakness versus cramping. This can lead to paralysis. Hyperkalemia also causes fatigue, nausea, paresthesis, and think pins and needles equals potassium. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about calcium. Uh, calcium is an extracellular cation. Your body gets calcium by ingesting food, and it's stored in the bone and excreted in the urine and feces. Calcium balance is controlled by the by parathyroid hormone, or PTH, and calcitonin. So I'm going to say that again. Calcium balance is controlled by parathyroid hormone, or PTH, and calcitonin. PTH is secreted by the parathyroid gland, and it regulates calcium through its effects on the bone, the kidneys, and the intestines. Vitamin D can be ingested or synthesized in the skin, and then it's activated in the kidneys and promotes calcium movement from the bone into the blood. So calcium can't move into the blood without vitamin D. This is why when you see calcium supplements in the stores, most of them are combined with vitamin D. So calcium provides structural strength for bones and teeth. It maintains the stability of nerve membranes and it's required for muscle contractions. It's also necessary for a lot of metabolic processes and enzyme reactions, and it's essential for blood clotting. Hypocalcemia is low serum calcium levels. Hypocalcemia is caused by hypoparathyroidism. So remember that the parathyroid gland secretes PTH, which controls calcium balance. And then think about the word hypoparathyroidism. So hypoparathyroidism is a, is a parathyroid gland that is hypoactive, so it's not producing enough PTH. No matter how much calcium is ingested, if there's not enough PTH, calcium is not going to be absorbed in the digestive tract and kidneys. So malabsorption syndrome, cause, um, which is a decrease absorption of either vitamin D or calcium in the intestines. And then in renal failure, the body retains phosphate, which causes a loss of calcium. So phosphate and calcium don't get along. If you have an excess of one, you have a deficit of the other. In renal failure, vitamin D is also not activated, which doesn't allow the intestines to absorb calcium. Hypocalcemia increases the permeability and excitability of nerve membranes, and that means spontaneous stimulation of muscles. So what you need to remember is muscle twitching, muscle spasms, especially in the hands and feet, and that's that carpal pedal spasm. And remember, muscle twitching versus cramping or weakness or any other muscle effect. Uh, tetany is muscle spasms, and I want you to read about Javostik's sign and Trousseau's sign in your book on page 27. As a nurse, you need to know these. It's important if your patient um, exhibits any of these signs that you recognize it right away and um, proceed with treatment for that. Hypocalcemia is also causes weak um, heart contractions because of the delayed conduction, and that can lead to dysrhythmias and a low blood pressure. So think hypocalcemia equals hypotension. Hypocalcemia has a different effect on skeletal muscle than it does on cardiac muscle. So skeletal muscle spasms are um, from increased irritability of the nerves, and cardiac muscle has fewer nerves, so the contraction is going to be weaker. Hypercalcemia is elevated serum calcium. The causes of hypercalcemia are uncontrolled release of calcium from the bones, and this happens in neoplasms, which are bone tumors. 
hyperparathyroidism. So remember that the parathyroid secretes PTH, which increases calcium absorption from the GI tract. So if the parathyroid is hyperactive, it's going to excrete excessive PTH, and that's going to cause excessive calcium absorption. Um, immobility, which decreases the stress on the bones, and that makes bones weaker, and that causes demineralization, which is calcium leaving the bone and then in going into the blood. So that's going to create um, an increase in the serum in the serum calcium level. And then either excessive vitamin D intake or excessive calcium intake or both. And then the milk alkali syndrome is just a fancy way of saying an excessive milk and antacid intake. So Tums are calcium carbonate and taking too many Tums can give you hypercalcemia, which would make your hands and feet twitch and possibly other issues that are associated with hypercalcemia. So remember to look at the table comparing hypo hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. It's on page 27 in your book. These tables that show the signs and symptoms are important to know. Hypercalcemia depresses neuromuscular activity and that causes muscle weakness, loss of muscle tone, lethargy, stupor, personality changes, anorexia, and nausea. So hypercalcemia also interferes with how ADH, remember that's the hormone that makes you not pee, uh, works in the kidneys and this causes polyuria which is an increased urination. If it's severe enough it can cause a decrease in renal function too. And remember how hypo hypocalcemia weakened cardiac contractions? Well hypercalcemia increases the strength of cardiac contractions which can cause dysrhythmias as well. So I'm not going to go into depth with magnesium imbalances. I just want you to know a couple of things. Um, elevated magnesium is called hypermagnesemia. Low magnesium is called hypomagnesemia. And magnesium plays a role in serum, in serum potassium levels. If a patient is hypokalemic, we give them potassium, but we also give them magnesium to help bring that potassium level up. Um, you're going to go more into depth in magnesium imbalances when you get into your nursing blocks. We're also not going to talk much about phosphate imbalances. Just know that elevated phosphate is hypo, or sorry, hyperphosphatemia, and low phosphate is hypophosphatemia, and that phosphate by, um, does not get along with calcium at all. So if there's a buildup of phosphate in your body, you're going to have a decrease of calcium. We also aren't going to go into chloride very much either. Um, I just know that elevated chloride is hyperchloremia and low chloride is hypochloremia. We are going to talk about pH and acid-base imbalances. So there's a very narrow window when it comes to pH. The normal range for pH is 7.35 to 7.45. And when we get to a pH of less than 6.8 or greater than 7.8, the patient's usually dead. Um, acidosis or acid, acidic, acidotic, um, that is an increase in hydrogen ions, which is a pH lower than 7.4. And alkalosis, which is a base, basic, alkal alkaline, alkalytic, alkalotic, um, that's a decrease in hydrogen ions, which is a pH of greater than 7.4. So don't get confused with the opposites. Just remember high hydrogen equals low pH and low hydrogen equals high pH. And as blood circulates, nutrients diffuse from the blood into the cells and waste diffuses from the cells into the blood. So this image is on page 30 in your book, and it demonstrates changes in acid, bicarbonate, ion, and serum pH that are circulating in the blood. So buffer systems control serum pH. A buffer is a combination of a weak acid and its alkaline salt, and they react with other acids and other alkali that are added to the blood, and they neutralize them. So the blood maintains a pretty consistent uh, pH of roughly 7.4. So in other words, a buffer is a solution in which adding small amounts of acid or base will not measurably change pH. That's the main thing I want you to know about buffers. 
All right, let's talk about acid base imbalances. This stuff can be tough to grasp, but I want you to have a basic understanding. You're going to go into much more detail in your nursing blocks, I promise. Before we talk about compensation, I want to talk about the bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system and the pH a little bit more um, to hopefully help explain acid base imbalances in a way that's easy to understand and remember. The basis of this system is that there are two components, the respiratory system and the kidneys, and they control the bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3. In the respiratory system, a chemical reaction occurs and uh, to form carbon dioxide, which is expired, or you breathe it out, along with water. So the carbon dioxide that we're talking about in this case is PaCO2, and that's a partial CO2, but just remember PaCO2 is the carbon dioxide that we're talking about when we talk about acid-base imbalances. Um, so there's less carbonic acid in the body when you breathe out CO2 and water. In the kidneys, hydrogen ions are excreted in the urine and bicarbonate ions are returned to the blood. So as one component of this whole system changes, the other has to change proportionately to maintain a normal serum pH. In the respiratory system, when the respiratory rate increases, more carbonic, or sorry, more carbon dioxide, which is an acid, is removed from the body. And when the respiratory rate decreases, more carbon dioxide is retained by the body. So there's four basic types of acid-base imbalances. Each imbalance is either respiratory or metabolic and acidotic or alkalotic. So we have respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, or metabolic alkalosis. A decrease in serum pH is acidosis, and if it's because of an increase in carbon dioxide levels, it's respiratory. If it's because of a decrease in bicarbonate ions, it's a renal problem or metabolic. An increase in serum pH is alkalosis, and if that's because of a decrease in carbon dioxide levels, it's respiratory, and if it's because of an increase in bicarbonate ions, it's metabolic. So I want you to remember a mnemonic, ROME, R-O-M-E. It stands for respiratory opposite metabolic equal. So what I mean by that is if it's respiratory, the pH and the PaCO2 are going to be opposite. So if you have an elevated pH, you're going to have a, a lower PaCO2 and vice versa. And then metabolic equal. So what that means is that um, if it's metabolic, your pH and your HCO3 or bicarbonate are going to either both be elevated or both be lowered. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, let's see. Respiratories are always, or sorry, respiratory disorders are always seen as an initial change in carbon dioxide and all of their problems are metabolic and they cause an increase in an initial change in the bicarbonate ions. So I put a file on Canvas called the ABG Cheat Sheet, and that might be something that's helpful for you to keep throughout nursing school. It's going to help you determine by um, ABG or, or arterial blood gas. Um, it's going to help you determine whether your situation is um, or what type of imbalance your situation is. All right, so now we can talk about compensation. Uh, compensation has to do with the body system that's not involved in the basic imbalance. So basically one system compensates when the other system isn't working properly. And again, we're talking about the respiratory system and the kidneys. So if the lungs aren't properly functioning, the kidneys compensate in order to keep a normal pH. And this is just a temporary band-aid for the problem. It doesn't fix the problem. So you have to watch your patient very carefully um, because patients compensate, 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 and then they stop compensating and they're very sick. Um, so in compensation, the pH is normal. In decompensation, um, that happens when the problem becomes more severe and the pH is no longer normal. So know that the two mechanisms that the body uses to correct an acid-base imbalance are compensation and decompensation.
So we talked about this a couple slides ago. Some values to, that I want you to remember. A normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. A normal carbon dioxide, or PaCO2 in our case, is 35 to 45. A normal uh, bicarbonate ion, is, or HCO3, is 22 to 26. A pH greater than 7.45 is alkalosis, and a pH of less than 7.35 is acidosis. So this table is on page 32 in your book, and it really is a great table to study. It's going to give you a lot more information to um, help you understand what you're going to see in your patient um, when they have these imbalances. So respiratory acidosis is the combination of a low pH plus a high PaCO2 plus a normal HCO3. Respiratory acidosis is an increase in carbon dioxide levels. It can be caused by an acute respiratory problem like pneumonia, airway obstruction like aspiration or asthma, a chest injury, or a drug that depresses the respiratory control center. And when you think of something like that, we're thinking um, drugs like opioids. Uh, it can also be caused by chronic problems like COPD. Metabolic acidosis is the combination of a low pH plus a normal PaCO2 plus a low HCO3. Metabolic acidosis is a decrease in bicarbonate ions. It can be caused by an excessive loss of bicarbonate ions like in diarrhea or by an increased use of serum bicarbonate to buffer the increased acids like in DKA. Um, in renal disease or failure where there's a decrease in the excretion of acids and in the production of bicarbonate ions. Um, and the effects of acidosis are impaired nervous system function, headache, lethargy, weakness, confusion, coma, death. Um, when you see someone compensating, you see deep, rapid breathing and secretion of urine with a low pH. So the next few slides are images of the different types of pH imbalances. You can find these in your book on pages 3 through 36. So this is an example of how respiratory acidosis plays out. It's on page 36 in your book, and then on page 37 is an example of how metabolic acidosis plays out. All right, so alkalosis is not as common as acidosis. Uh, respiratory alkalosis is elevated pH plus low PaCO2 plus normal HCO3. And it's caused by hyperventilation related to anxiety, high fever, an overdose of aspirin, head injuries, or a brainstem tumor. Metabolic alkalosis is elevated pH plus normal PaCO2 plus elevated HCO3, and that's caused by vomiting, hypokalemia, or the excessive ingestion of antacids like Tums. So alkalosis irritates the nervous system and causes restlessness, muscle twitching, numbness and tingling of the fingers, tetany, seizures, and even coma. So to treat an acid-base imbalance, we have to treat the underlying cause or the reason for the imbalance. So we have to get rid of whatever is causing this imbalance in order to fix it. Um, so to do that, we can give or remove fluids and electrolytes, we can give bicarbonate, and we can modify someone's diet. Okay, so I know that that's a lot of information, especially paired with what we went over on Monday. Um, so like I said before, in Canvas, there's some files that I have um, set up for extra help for fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Um, there's the ABG cheat sheet for acid-base imbalances. Um, and as I mentioned, your chapter one quiz is due Wednesday the 27th, but I have extended your chapter two and three quizzes to Friday the 29th so that you have time to listen to the lectures. Um, 
chapter three lecture will be posted on Wednesday, probably evening time. Um, if you have any issue, issues or questions, please reach out to me. I am more than happy to spend more time going over this with you guys um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, however, unfortunately on Monday we do need to move on. So please let me know if there's any way that I can help you in the meantime. And I hope that you guys have a good rest of the week.